Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've covered a lot of ground. I, th I think uh, maybe today has been like World War I. It keeps going and going, but we're getting to armistice. And it is really a, a distinct honor and a personal privilege to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Williamson Murray is a professor emeritus of history at The Ohio State University. The Ohio State. Yeah. As a cocky young captain just one or two years ago, I think it was, uh, and I was selected for graduate school at Ohio State before going to West Point, Wick served as one of my principal graduate advisors. And as a cocky young captain, you, you kind of think you uh, have everything going and you know how to write, you know how to speak, this is gonna be easy. Up until my first graduate seminar with Dr. Murray. And with a great sense of humor, a wicked red pen and a giant stamp marked passive, Wick quickly burst my bubble that I had any talent as a writer, much less as any talent for a future academic career. So in that first graduate seminar, I quickly, I'm anxious, I'm thinking, hey, that, I did a good job on that, Wick hands it back, and I look at all this red, and in that first paper, what I found is that he wrote, rewrote the first three pages of the paper. Of course, I had the, all those stamps on there, it's hard to see. But as characteristic of his authentic concern for students, he coached and mentored me through the graduate process. And not only did he teach me how to write, more importantly, he taught me how to think. And both those things were indispensable, not just in an academic sense, but in my career as a professional army officer, and now with roles reversed. I don't have the uh, passage stamp, but I think I do have that red pen that she lent me. Wick is a strategic thinker and a prolific writer on a number of important topics, not only in military history, but on national security, strategy, and strategic concepts. He has way too many publications for me to mention here. You can look in the program, but needless to say, he's made very profound contributions in the fields of military effectiveness, strategy, military revolutions, and contributed a major work on the Second World War and many campaign studies. He is currently the Chair of Strategic Studies at the Marine Corps University. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a welcome for Dr. Williamson Murray. Gee, Dave, I, I thought you would uh, start, uh, at least mention uh, of the book that, uh, my, one of my, my most recent books on the War of Southern Aggression. Um, I'm going to start off with the story. My wife's heard it, Kelly's heard it, Dave's heard it, but most of the rest of you haven't. It's just too good not to pass up. Yeah, in 1918, as I think uh, um, many of you may know, Winston Churchill was the uh, m major architect of, of the British munitions uh, uh, effort. Um, uh, and uh, um, uh, this isn't about that period. Uh, um, uh, um, in the late 1930s, of course, Churchill was the great warner of the danger of uh, Nazi Germany represented it and how Britain was uh, um, uh, <clears throat> being caught flat-footed in terms of its complete lack of rearmament effort. And in April of 1938, he was giving a uh, oration uh, in the House of Commons, and he only gave orations. He didn't give speeches. Um, and it was on how Britain needed more air defense, which is, he was certainly write about. Uh, and in the middle of his, of his oration, uh, somebody, one of the backbenchers, could have been from any party given political attitudes at the time, shouted out, how much is enough? Churchill paused and said, that reminds me of a man who received a telegram from Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> 
And the telegram said, your mother-in-law dead, wire instructions. So Churchill paused and he said, and so the man wired back, embalm, cremate, bury at sea, take no chances. <laughs> I'm not going to really stick to uh, what I uh, was asked to do because, in fact, everybody else has done it already. Uh, and I'd simply be sort of uh, uh, regurgitating. Uh, I want to, in my talk, place the First World War uh, and what was learned in a more and larger historical context of not just the United States, but the United States and the rest of the world in this terrible conflict, which I think is by far and away the most important conflict that took place in, 20, in the 20th century. Everything that happened after 1918 was driven in one way or another by what happened between 1914 and 1918. It was, in every sense of the word, an unmitigated catastrophe. Where to place it in its larger historical context? And we historians, military, economic, social, really don't do a terribly good job of trying to look at the larger context of human history um, in terms of uh, sort of the American um, uh, uh, effort. The only person I can th really think of is William McNeil, who managed to, to place both the rise of the West uh, and the influence of technology on war uh, in a far larger context than most of the rest of us uh, operate. I'm actually trying to push, I think, the uh, um, boundaries on that understanding. And so let me turn to the question of what I would call, and I'm presently calling, military social revolutions. It goes back to a conference that I <coughs> participated in at Quantico in 1999, um, in which there were a number of sort of, uh, subject was revolutions in military affairs, um, and had a number of historians, Jeffrey Parker, John Lynn, McGregor Knox, Holger Herwig, and we were trying to figure out after the conference was over what exactly was going on if these sort of major changes were occurring uh, in the, the historical landscape from 1600 on. And we came to the conclusion, which is somewhat summed up in a book that I edited uh, with McGregor Knox called The Dynamics of Military Revolution. We came to the uh, conclusion that there were great overarching massive points that you can look at in the history of the West since 1600 um, uh, through to uh, uh, the 20th century. Um, that so changed, if you will, the social and political landscape and technological landscape um, that a series of then revolutions in military affairs occurred. The first of these we suggested, led by Jeffrey Parker and John Lynn, was what happened in the 17th century, which was really the creation of the modern state, as we think of it, an organized, um, uh, disciplined, bureaucratic capacity to run uh, human affairs in a more effective fashion than had been the case um, uh, throughout history. Um, and then a series of military revolutions occurred under that, the most important of which was the creation of modern armies and modern navies. Uh, and beyond that, undergirding that, is what occurs at the end of the 17th century, the creation of, uh, first in Holland and then in um, uh, uh, Britain, the creation, the capacity of the modern state to tax itself and its population without having to borrow uh, if you will, from bankers or from individuals. Um, the second and third of these great revolutions, we decided, occurred at the end of the 18th century. The first of these was the Industrial Revolution, beginning in the 1750s, 1760s, very difficult to put it down um, uh, exactly. Um, and then the French Revolution in um, uh, occurring uh, uh, in the 1790s. And both of these fundamentally changed the social and political dynamics of human affairs, particularly in the Western world. 
And then the fourth of these revolutions, we came to the conclusion, um, and my book on the Civil War very much argues along these lines, that you can't understand the American Civil War unless you understand that the fourth of these revolu social military revolutions occurred between 1861 and 1865. And that was the combination of the, the combination of the Industrial Revolution and the French Revolution together. Because without that combination, you could not have, have, have uh, the North could not have done two essential elements which are entirely new in human history. The first is the massive projection of land power supported logistically over continental distances. And the second portion of it was both North and South, the um, uh, mobilization of societies to support war almost endlessly. And of course, it was only when the South ran out of its manpower, quite literally ran out of its manpower in 1865. I remember seeing at West Point when I was teaching there a figure that one of the Civil War historians had come up with. Um, uh, uh, and that was that out of Southern males between the ages of 15 and 60, that 50% were their maimed or killed. And there just simply was no willpower left. I think very clearly the tragedy of World War I is that nobody learned that lesson from the, first world, from the Civil War, that in fact the combination of the French Revolution and Industrial uh, Revolution. Uh, and it was partially, again, it's very easy for us to see um, uh, um, why maybe people should have thought. A few did. The Polish banker Bloch clearly understood that. Um, but very clearly, the thinking before 1914 was that modern societies could not support long wars politically because they were softer than previous societies. Uh, and modern societies um, uh, <coughs> um, uh, could not support such wars financially, a long war. And that's why, of course, what every, why everybody is driven in 1914, as Michael Howard has pointed out, to trying to make the First World War a short war. In fact, Grand Maison and the theories in France were quite literally that the last battalion surviving in the French army launching a kamikaze attack would overwhelm the last German battalion. What, of course, they did not understand, um, or they did understand, um, and we're, 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 we're counseling and they wanted a quick, decisive victory um, to, to avoid the danger of financial breakdown or political breakdown. Well, they got both because, in fact, the modern state proved that, in fact, it's not soft and that it's bureaucratically can force its population, uh, if it plays its, its game right, um, to, to to, as, as Kennedy said, bear any burden, um, pay any price. We did that uh, in World War II. Um, the Germans tried that in two world wars with a n notable lack of success at the very end. Um, and so I think we have to understand World War I is a war in which, just like the Civil War, Decisive victories, Napoleonic decisive victories, have disappeared from the historical landscape. You can't win a decisive, there is no such thing as a decisive victory. Um, I think in terms of World War II, the German invasion of Barbarossa in 1941 is, is, is a straight out attempt to win a decisive victory quickly uh, and, uh, um, if you will, end the conflict, conquer Russia without um, um, uh, paying an exorbitant price. The price, the problem, of course, is that the Soviet Union was able to stand up. Now, there's a second larger problem in terms of understanding the First World War, which explains, um, I think, both our difficulties when we come in in 1917, 1918, um, and then I think we can say the U.S. did a pretty good job, all things considered, over that period. And that is that war is a complex adaptive system, to use biological terms. That if you look at, and I've used this example um, a couple of times, the British Expeditionary Force that goes to 
France in 1914 is in terms of the sharp end, infantry, tactical training, the best in the world. And in Flanders in November 1914, they slaughtered the Germans by the bucketful in, in terms of the uh, um, uh, slaughter of the German university uh, students in Flanders. Uh, and they were extraordinarily good at doing <coughs> what they had learned in the Boer War, which is, um, I think the average British infantryman was supposed to put, uh, um, and somebody here may have a, a more accurate figure, but something on the order of, of six bullets per minute uh, into target uh, bullseye at 300 yards. And they did that. They did that to the Germans. And, um, and yet, when we look at two years later, on the 1st of July, 1916, the British are the ones getting slaughtered, that in fact they have not adapted to the changes that have occurred on the Western Front. And, and the way that, uh, it may have been later that I have thought this up, that uh, either Dave or Kelly may not, not have heard it, but the way I think of the First World War now, in terms of understanding that there is the contesting sides are inventing modern combined arms war. And it required a whole bunch of things which for many of the people who've served in the Army and ground forces of the Marine Corps understand intuitively because it's part of their training, but it did not exist. And one of the things that I think you have to understand tactically or almost anything in human affairs is that obvious things are not obvious until somebody points them out and then everybody else picks it up because it's obvious. But until somebody points out the obvious, uh, and in terms of the First World War, it's much more than obvious problems. It's problems that I'm not gonna go into because I'm not talking about the First World War, but the US uh, and the impact of the war. But the way I, I look at, the, if you will, this complex adaptive system in which as the British change, the Germans change. As the French change, the Germans change. So that the, what tactically worked very clearly in, in terms of Nivelle's November uh, 1916 offensive at, at Verdun works very well against the Germans. Five months later, it's a catastrophe in terms of the spring 1917 offensive because the Germans have adapted a wholly new de defensive philosophy, de defense in depth. The way I look at it in larger sense is that it, you can take you could take a regimental commander off of the um, battlefield in 1918 and take him to um, uh, um, the 1991 uh, uh, Gulf War, which General P uh, obviously participated in. Um, uh, and once you explain the difference in speed and tempo and the emphasis on a far more mechanized approach, he'd understand what you were trying to do. If you took a regimental commander off the battlefield of 1914 and put him in a 1918 um, battle, probably late summer 1918, he would have no clue. He would not understand, if you will, the philosophical interrelationship of the pieces. And that invention of, if you will, modern war um, was extraordinarily difficult. And um, the military, I think, uh, intellectually was not prepared to do that. Um, professional military education was really only beginning uh, to get its start. Uh, and so it was an extraordinarily difficult set of problems. Now, the US, of course, shows up. and, and in, in a typical American fashion, I guess, we basically sort of show up and say, um, we know everything and we don't have much to learn from you. <laughs> um, uh, and in fact, we begin to learn very quickly from both the French and the British and unfortunately from the Germans in a number of places. Um, I, I, in, in general terms, let me say, I think we're far more effective than were given credit for. If you understand that there were relatively few graduates of a real staff college, Leavenworth, 
um, and relative, even fewer graduates of, a war, of the war colleges, um, that the level, if you will, of ca capacity to um, do what uh, obviously uh, um, uh, General Marshall, then Colonel Marshall, was able to do, um, it was a very difficult process. And if you compare, for example, the performance of the um, U.S. Army in, in the last half of 1918, you understand that the, if you will, the intellectual underpinnings of the senior officer corps are much weaker than they are in 1944. Um, Hal Winton has written a wonderful piece on the corps commanders, and if you look carefully at the corps commanders, they've all got the same educational background. They understand each other, they understand their opponents. None of them became particularly famous generals, but there was a, uh, if you will, a coherence of doctrine and understanding. Uh, and of course, we did far better, I think, again, from my perspective, uh, uh, in, the, in the Battle of the uh, Bulge than we're usually given credit for. Um, I, I think innovation, again, one of the things you see both in uh, World War II uh, and in World War I in terms of the American is far more uh, innovations bubbling up from the bottom. One of my favorite stories of the, uh, uh, of the um, uh, World War I in terms of American troops is the American, one of the American so solutions the Americans came up with in terms of handling the barbed wire problem was to take big rolls of chicken wire and roll it up over the barbed wire and then stamp on the chicken wire and walk over it rather, rather than having to cut your way through it or to knock it down. Again, it's typical American sort of, of, of just like the sergeant that enveloped, uh, invented the rhinos that uh, took out uh, uh, the bocage in Normandy. Um, I think the real indication of how good we were or were not would have come in 1919 um, uh, because we were still very much learning uh, the process. Um, and what's difficult to judge in terms of looking at the Muse Argonne, for example, we clearly did much better later on than at the very beginning, um, but the German army is beginning to fall apart. In terms of the German um, spring offensives, what hasn't been mentioned, uh, except for high casualties, I've got, I know the fig because the figures are in the German official history, um, the Germans in four months of major offensive operations lost nearly one million casualties. If you look at the major offenses, um, uh, like the Somme or Passchendaele or Verdun, they all last about the same length of time, about four months, a number of casualties, about 400 to 500,000. The Germans managed, even though you see much more territory taken, the Germans managed to kill off twice as many people in four months as the French and the British had, and they couldn't afford it. They were done. And of course, there's the great tragedy of the First World War, is that when it was all over, the Germans slunk off and then pretended they hadn't been beaten. And unfortunately, substantial portions of both the military and the political leadership um, swallowed that or perpetrated that lie. Um, my sense is that um, Pershing's suggestion that the war continued was obviously the right one, but politically there was no way that the French uh, and the British were going to, to, to allow that. But what Pershing, I think, should have demanded is that the German senior leadership surrender in the field that Hindenburg uh, and Ludendorff and the senior German army and corps commanders surrender in the field, uh, um, which would have made the whole sort of stab in the back legend uh, um, go out the window. Now, what was learned? I think the catastrophe was so large um, that only perspective could give uh, anybody a real sense of what uh, had happened. Uh, and it's very interesting to look at how different nations and different militaries took to learning the lessons of the last war. And I'm going to talk about the U.S. military last because I think it's the most interesting. The Germans, complete idiocy, 
They, they look for a solution, a tactical solution, to do tactics better in the next war. And they did tactics much better in the next war. They got the grand strategy completely wrong. They managed to repeat every single major strategic mistake they'd made in World War I and World War II. That's really an enormous accomplishment. The British, very tragically intellectually, and again, it, it, I think this is where traveling through Europe, not just to see the American cemeteries, which I've done and uh, tremendously worth doing, but the French and the German uh, and the British, um, and when you go to the uh, Thiepval um, Memorial, which has listed 73,000 names whose bodies were never recovered, you have a sense of why British society missed the boat in terms of understanding the danger that Adolf Hitler and the Germans represented in the late 30s. The French um, understood the Germans might come again, um, but the French got a lot wrong in the late 30s. Bad military leadership, bad political leadership, and again, one of those sort of, uh, sort of immutable, very difficult to predict things in human history um, uh, is the quality of leadership, which is, uh, talking to General Petraeus one time uh, in New York, um, it's a wild card. Union wins in the Civil War because of two individuals, Lincoln and Grant. Without them, they don't win. The South wins the war. Um, Winston Churchill, and again, I don't know how many of you have seen the dark hour, or darkest hour, I can't remember. Um, without Churchill, Britain quits the war. If Churchill had been hit by that New York taxi cab in 1931 more directly and been killed, Britain would not have stayed in the war. And the Germans would have been able to handle the Russians all by themselves. And, and so this, this is the huge problem. Uh, and so let me turn to the Americans um, for a few comments, because we really did learn. Whereas the French and the British and the Germans in one way or another are running away from the dark results of World War I, I think very clearly both the U.S. Navy uh, and the U.S. Army in terms of its educational system, and it is the great moment for American professional military education, um, a lesson that we should be paying attention to right now and aren't. But we understood very clearly that if there were going to be another war, it would involve, among the major powers, it would in one way or another soon involve the United States. And it would involve, just like World War I had, the projection of military power over oceanic distances, not just continental distances, but oceanic distances. Um, and so the importance of schooling, command and staff, and uh, War College for the Army, and War College, the Navy, is extraordinarily important in terms of preparing um, for, once again, we got into the business of seriously preparing late, although very clearly Roosevelt had learned a great many lessons watching how badly the uh, Wilson administration had done. Um, but even beyond that, I think it's worth noting the foundation in the 1920s of the Industrialized College of the Armed Forces, a recognition that the next war was absolutely going to depend on how well American industry did, and it had not done terribly well in World War I. <coughs> we had slopped around at the edges. And then, irony of ironies, um, Franklin Roosevelt looking at the period before the uh, um, Second World War as president pushed for two things. One was obvious, the Navy, given the nature of the Pacific Ocean and the nature of the Japanese. The other thing was air power. Now, I think very clearly Roosevelt, like most thinkers of the time, thought air power was going to be the cheap way out. I think, in fact, it was the right way to go because it breaks the German economy. <laughs> 
There is no doubt about that. And plays the crucial role in enabling allied Anglo-American forces to make it back. But in terms of, of avoiding attrition warfare in the trenches, attrition now moved to the skies. And having written about the great battles of 43 and 44 in the air, the irony, of course, is that attrition is now in the air. You look from April 43 to May 1944, with the exception of only one or two months, 8th Air Force is taking 30% crew losses every month. 30% crew losses. They picked 25 missions because they knew virtually nobody was going to make it. With that, I will stop World War I. Again, I uh, take my hats off to VMI and to the Virginia Commission that set this up, uh, and to you people for having the interest to come and listen to what I thought was a wonderful conference. So thank you all very much.